We begin with business this morning. Rotus Ojiris is here to join us. Rotus, great to have you. Good morning. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, morning Doctor. Good morning. morning. All our viewers out there. Yes, uh, the economic growth figures for the third quarter of the year were released on Friday. A whole lot happened on Friday. We'll get into the central bank governor's speech at the CIBN. But first off, 2.54% year on year in real terms in the third quarter of 2023. Compare that to the other numbers you're looking at. It was 2.51% in the second quarter of this year, 231 in the first quarter, this time last year, in 2022, it was 2.25%. Not quite keeping up with population growth, but here we are. If we take a look at quarterly GDP as we chart it going back to, I don't know, 2020 or so, and going all the way to 2023, you can see all the way back 4.03% in Q3 2021. And then we go, we, we've been, we've been slowing. Economy has been slowing. Of course, we had, you know, some issues there with oil production and so on and so forth. We're at 2.54. Now, speaking of oil production, it continues continues to contract, but not at as bad a level as prior quarters. So 0.85% contraction in Q3, uh, Q2, 13, Q1, 4.7, and then it was 22.67 in the third quarter of last year. The oil sector continues to struggle. What about oil production? Um, we, are, we, are, we are at a new low in the first quarter or second quarter of this year at 1.2 million barrels per day, but we've climbed to 1.45. Still, if you look all the way to the left of your screen, you'll see that Nigeria has not hit 2 million barrels per day since the first quarter of 2020 when we were hit by the lockdowns of the COVID pandemic. So that's what we're seeing as far as oil production. It was non-oil, of course, that drove the economy. The non-oil sector growing by 2.75%, slowing from 3.5 in Q2, 2.7 in Q1. In the, fourth, in the third quarter of last year, it was 4.27. 94-95% in contribution to the economy is the non-oil sector, about 5% for the oil sector. Your top 10 contributing activities Crop production leading the way as it did in the last quarter, 27%. Trade in second place, 15%. Telco, ICT, 13.5%. Real estate, which was in fifth position last time, jumps to fourth. Outpacing crude petroleum and natural gas at 5.48. That's the first half of the top 10. Your second half, food, beverage, and tobacco, 4.1. Financial institutions, construction, professional scientific and technical services, and other services, all uh, both below uh, about 3.2, 2.18%. But still, when you think about crop production, even though it is the largest contributor to the economic growth, look at where it is. One, it hasn't even done 2% over the last three quarters, 1.35%, yet makes up 92% of activities in that agricultural sector. Agric, 1.3% slowing from where it was in 1.5. You can see livestock, forestry, and fishing. We still have a whole lot more they've got to do. Look at mining and quarrying. Just that one is in recession. Manufacturing, which is supposed to be the bane of our economy as far as pushing forward, a paltry 0.48% in the third quarter, down from 2.2 in the second quarter. You can see oil refining in recession. Textile and apparel, that's in recession. Motor vehicle like an assembly, yeah, it's just barely treading water there. Transport and storage down, road transportation, that as well uh, contracting. Rail and transport and pipelines, air transport barely up there. So look, it's still the same story. We move on to trade. Look at that, trade is 1.53% down from 24 Real estate, eh, 1.9. Financials, yeah, that's one of the better performance uh, performers. We'll get to the civilian governor in a moment. Education and human health, 1.45, 2.93. Um, uh, okay, ICT as well, 6.69%, slowing from 8.6. Telco, 7.7 from 9.7. Look at movies, sound production, music production in red. Contracting, two consecutive contractions, essentially in recession. Broadcasting doing all right, 3.1. Arts, entertainment, and recreation, 4.45. And speaking of arts, entertainment, and recreation, just as a reminder of the um, lofty ambitions of our minister to get it to 10%, just to show you where we are right now, 0.2% in the third quarter as far as its contribution to the GDP, 0.21 in Q2, 0.31, pretty much, not you know, b barely anywhere. So there's a long way to go in terms of that so uh, respect. Like yeah, it's it. it's it's a big, it's a long long way to go. Um, what else has been going on? The um, uh, the governor, central bank governor, Mr. Yemi Cardoso, at the CIBN, uh, Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, on Friday, we covered the speech. Highlights: discontinue CBN direct quasi intervention activities. That is a move to reduce money supply. He talked about the OMO auctions, open market operations, which are essentially securities that are given to the market in order to collect Naira from them. The last auction, 17%. That might increase. He said there's going to be another one. Seeking recapitalization of the banks. Back in 2004, the last recapitalization went from 2 billion 
minimum capital requirement to 25 billion. At that time, that was worth $187 million. Today, as he pointed out on Friday, that's worth only 32 million. So that has to increase. <laughs> and then he says CBN is to return to orthodox monetary policy. Uh, Yemi Cardoso wants, I, I call it banking body building. He wants the banks to eat more protein, lift more weights, do more exercise and get bigger, right? So if we look at the banking sector, uh, as far as Nigeria's banking assets are concerned for the uh, 2022, I think in total, it was about 79.3 trillion. Yeah, or 79.5 trillion. That's our total banking industry assets for 2022. That, if you take 435 Naira to the dollar, about 169 billion, so 24% climb. However, if you're talking about supporting an economy that wants to grow to $1 trillion, and he talks about needing bigger banks that can support that type of economy, where do you rank? Well, if you look at the top five banks in Southern Africa, not quite there, because if you take that entire total asset figure of 169 billion, that doesn't even meet up to, it's, barely, it's just under Standard Bank Group, which is the biggest bank in, uh, in Africa. Its total assets for 2022 is equal to the entire asset base of all Nigerian banks. Second place, first round, APSA Bank is in third place, Ned Bank is in fourth. Now, um, Ajiratari, which is a fourth, uh, which is a, Mor a Moroccan bank, would be fourth if we included all of Africa. But I just said we should look at Southern Africa. Investec is in fifth place. Now, if you look at um, next up, I think it's deposits um, for the top five African banks, that African banks, that includes the Ajiratari Bank in Morocco. It comes up to 394 billion in terms of deposits. Nigerian banks, 13 of the major banks, 141. Now, the question is this for Dr. Rufa, everybody out there. Who are the people that are making deposits in banks? It's individuals and it is uh, businesses, right? So if you want to get a bigger banking, so you need to grow your economy so that people can make more money, make more put more deposits into the banks and so on and so forth and get it to where it is. That's pretty much what we're looking so at today. So pretty much it's businesses because largely uh, are the ones that are making the giant deposits because when you even look at it, Nigerian uh, De uh, Deposit Insurance Commission, NDIC says, about over 98% of the population does not have over 500,000 in their bank accounts. That's true. Yep. So yep. most of these deposits are going to be from businesses and high net worth individual. But the question is, how can we improve on the prospect of business? That's where we go. Let's see if you go back to your data on uh, you know, sectors of the economy, crop production. Yep. The question is, how much are we able to maximize even crop production? What We've is the about tonnage yeah, yeah. of crop? Yield per hectare. What is the yield per hectare? Yeah. See, Rotus, we're doing about four, over 400,000 tons. Our biggest yield in cocoa was about the early 70s, I think 72 or 73. Mm. It was over 400,000 tons of cocoa. Today, we are doing half that. So 50 years ago, we're doing more cocoa than we're doing now. We're doing half of the cocoa we're doing now. In 65, 66, we had one third of the tomato in the West African sub-region. But today, we're struggling with tomato. So even with crop production, we've plummeted so much. Uh, tuba crops, for instance, cassava and all of that, how can we spur and increase production? There's this great woman, I think you should even go do uh, investigative journalism about that, is doing thousands of you know, tons of uh, in oil. That woman built an entire ecosystem and all of that. Apart from women like that and, and some other places in, in Benu and the likes, we need more capital more investment. Scale. More Talked scale. About scale. Yep, yep, yep. In this industry to be able to build the economy. Because you see, when we say an economy is big, it has scale. Mm. Argentina has plummeted so much because its production capacity dropped tremendously. From 1860 yeah. to about 1930, Argentina is built about the biggest economy in the world because they were doing about 1.5 billion in trade, mm. in exports. So for us to be able to get those numbers up, we need to, and look at those numbers on capitalization. 187 million was 25 billion then. 187 million dollars. Today, it's just 32 million. Yeah. It shows you how deplorable the state of the economy has become. I support Mr. Cardozo, we need to recapitalize the banks, but the threshold too must be convenient for all. And industry stakeholders responded in Daily Independent this morning, we were talking about the need to make it transparent. So we hope he does well. He also talked about the MPC. Was I hearing him saying that we are done for MPC this year? So he said that as far as the requirements, yeah. they're at least required to meet at least four times a year, which has yeah. already been done. So uh, no. there was, you know, so but we, we still wanted we to, need to meet more. Right, right, right. 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 But as far as the requirements yeah. by law, yeah, yeah. Four, four, four meetings already. So we need to do yeah. more. Let's start <clears throat> with Cardoso. The reason we were given for the MPC not holding since August is the fact that the CBN governor was going to address the Chartered Institute of Bankers, 58th annual general meeting of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. And he has done that now. So I find it strange that 
Abdul Mumine, who is the spokesperson for the CBN, had given the impression that uh, you know the MPC will still hold this year. Mm. But the other explanation that we have been given is that they need to reconstitute the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, and that we need also the intervention of the presidency. I, I hope they should get on with that very quickly, for sure. because the MPC meeting regularly, looking at the uh, fundamentals within the economy, will speak to the value that will place on financial stability. Now that they have had a pepper soup and jollof rice uh, event at the Chartered Institute of uh, Bankers Annual, 58th Annual General Meeting, yes. one of the things coming out, which you didn't point attention to, is his allegation mm. that the central bank that inherited spent 10 trillion naira on quasi-fiscal activities. That's a very direct criticism, mm. you know, of his predecessor in office, uh, Godwin Emefiele. But the question is, what is, uh, what is he going to do about it? He says the CBM will return to orthodox ways. So we take this to mean, you know, as uh, laymen who are not bankers, to mean that the central bank will be taken back to focusing more on monetary policy. He also promised at that event that he's going to fix the economy. Well, we're going to hold him responsible for that. He says that the Tinubu administration is committed to turning this into a $1 trillion economy, where the details are rather short, mm. uh, but we'll be more interested in the details. But at the level of signaling, I think he used that uh, AGM of uh, the, uh, the dinner of the uh, Institute of Bankers uh, to reassure the banking community that it means business and that he and his team will be able to make a difference. Now he's increasing capital base, you know, for the banks. Well, I haven't quite seen the responses by the bankers, but you know the bankers, even if they feel anyhow, nobody wants to offend the regulator. Indeed. But as time passes, we'll know, you know, where they stand and how they feel in this matter. But if the presidency wants to re reconstruct the Monetary Policy Committee, can they get on with it? The other issue that we discussed on Friday was Black Friday. <laughs> yes. So it looks like Black Friday did very well in the United States, about yes. $9.8 billion yes. in yes. one day. Yeah. Although we're told $79 million out of that was from people who do this, what they call buy, buy now, pay later. Uh, pay later. <laughs> but there has been a significant incre increase from last year mm. in terms of people looking for the best deals. possible deals that they can get. Finally, Somalia mm. has now joined the Economic African Community. That didn't come easy, joining the EAC, you know, but it's a step forward for Somalia, a country rocked by civil war for As three decades. Yep. Now, if they become, now that they become part of that community, it will give them opportunities. But the issue is about terrorism. There are Shabab in Somalia, because once you are a member of the EAC, it means your citizens can move freely uh -huh. within the community. Right. The second thing is that Transparency International declared Somalia the most corrupt country uh, in Africa, however, mm. or perhaps in the world. Mm. However, the EAC emphasizes good governance. But the attraction here, and why I think Somalia has finally been admitted, is because Somalia has uh, a coastline of about 3,500 kilometers, which can link those East African countries with the Arab Peninsula. Trade. So trade. Yes, and sir. then they have a very strong marine economy, particularly fishing. Mm. So I think the- They have pirates the too. The other <laughs> member, they have pirates <laughs> too. As one film <laughs> established. Yeah. So, you know, but you see that the other members of the EAC, yeah. Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, uh, DLC, mm. you know, they weighed their options. Indeed. Uh, so let's see how it plays out. Indeed. You know, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rochus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so moving on to other news stories making headlines around the globe. Uh, His Royal Majesty Omonoba Nedo Okwakpolokpolo, a war the second, the above Benin is optimistic that this time will come when Nigerians will not need the cost to determine election winners. He made the remarks when he paid a courtesy call on Governor of Lagos State Babajide Sonwolu on Sunday. Our eyes correspondent Oba Adeoye was there. The rich culture of Bini people on display to herald the arrival of His Royal Majesty Omonoba Nedo Okuakpunokpolo, a war the second to the residence of Lagos State Governor in Marina. The Oba has come on a courtesy visit 
to the governor. The highly respected monarch congratulated Governor Sawolu for his election victory both at the polls and so far at the court, adding that he hopes that one day winners of elections will be solely determined by the people's vote and not the court. Oba Ewari II says the election of a former governor of the state as Nigeria's president was ordained by God and prayed for the success of President Bola Tinobo. We are happy to be here. We thank God for uh, the chairman arise. But he's also been responsible for my flying all over Nigeria. Because <laughs> I don't like flying, actually. Our illustrious son here says I should be flying, that road is not good. So each time I want to fly, it makes the aircraft services available. So I want to say that I appreciate that uh, uh, very much. I, um, I think, um, Your Excellency, we want to repeat again our congratulations to Mr. President. We, we are happy that it's all over now. It has gone to the to the end of the road. Whatever controversies or, or objections or whatever cannot go beyond that. But God has ordained that President Tino will be, be the president. And uh, we thank God for your also success, uh, successful, uh, successful uh, you know, uh, election. Um, we pray for you. We pray you'll be successful in tenure. Your cabinet will do well for us, for Nigeria. For the Oba of Benin, Nigeria's diversity should be exploited for the development of the nation and mutual progress of the people. He advised that differences should be addressed in manners that will strengthen cooperation among the citizens. Nigeria is, is, is big because we are together. When they say the biggest country in, um, in Africa, because it's Nigeria, it's because the way we are. So it's good to remain like this, but, but iron out differences that we have. Everywhere they have differences. Let's iron out our own and remain, remain the same, you know, remain, learn to live together. In his welcome speech, Governor Sanwulu assured the Oba of President Tinubu's commitment to turning around the fortunes of Nigeria for the better, emphasizing that the evidence is already manifesting. The governor commended the chairman of Arise Global Media, Prince Nduka Obaigbina, and foremost banker Aibuji Aigimokwedi, who were on the entourage of the Oba. He says the men are proud ambassadors of the Oba in Lagos and beyond. Let me, on behalf of all of us, welcome you. Welcome you to Lagos. Welcome you to the state of aquatic splendor. Let me welcome you to the commercial economic nerve center of our country, to the center of excellence. Let me say clearly to you that Mr. President is aware that you are coming this afternoon. I was with him about three hours ago, three, four hours ago, and we had other conversation. And the main reason why I said I had to leave is I was hosting you this evening. He said, really? I said, yes. He says I should extend his best wishes to you and that he's, um, he knows that you'll continue to pray for him. And you all have repeated it here today. And so on behalf of Mr. President, I want to thank you for your fatherly role for your prayers, for your best wishes for his government, and I'm sure that he will not disappoint you. You see, the two men that are also with you here, they are your sons, but they are your sons that are doing you proud and well in Lagos. <laughs> Iboji I Imokwede is not just a friend and a brother, he's also my co-chairman on a lot of things that we're doing together here in Lagos. He's one of our very, very best finest bankers, investment bankers that this country has presented. And of course, the Duke himself, 
we call him the World Duke. Uh, uh, the fear of Unduka is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> He's a great friend, a man that speaks truth to power, and a man that I share breakfast with once in a while, just to advise me. Mr. Governor thereafter took the Omonoba on a tour of the J.K. Randall Center for Yoruba Culture and History in Onikon, where the beautiful culture of the Yoruba people was on parade. Yoruba has encouraged us to continue to ensure that the very best is what this country deserves. So we've had that in at the State House in Marina, not too far off from here. And um, he did ask a question, so what else? And we said, okay, we have a little museum here that is a Yoruba cultural museum that has not been fully open you know, to the public, but that we can indeed come in here and show the other, the J. Randall you know, um, Center for Yoruba Culture and Museum. Because you know how, how traditional you know, uh, um, the Oba is, you know, to the entire Benin Kingdom, how he has, he has so much passion for museum, for Benin artifact, for Benin, you know, just to also give him a teaser, because we know too well that they, he has plans, you know, for similar things, and so we, we're taking him round, and he has seen things, and it's really, really, at, at the risk of speaking on behalf of, it, of, of Oba himself, he's really impressed with what we've done, you know, and he's happy with what he had seen, they had given us a few suggestions, you know, and then um, the entire ground is really just, you know, wanted that is he in Nigeria. I said, yes, we're here in Lagos and we can also still do better than what it is there. So we're indeed very happy and excited that, you know, a, a first class, you know, institution of our tradition you know, in Nigeria can find time to come and visit this place. Lagos and Benin share a history dating back to the pre colonial era, which the Oba and Governor want to be sustained for mutual progress and development. Oba Adeoye, Rice News, Lagos. Okay, very significant uh, event there. Um, Iwara II, uh, Oba Tope, uh, visiting uh, Lagos. Uh, for him, it's also some kind of homecoming. Mm. You recall that, uh, you know, the first king, the first uh, king of Lagos, uh, Prince Adu, uh, you know, was a Benin prince uh, who settled in Lagos and uh, met the Awaris and then named the territory on the Lagos Island Eko. And Eko for many years uh, was the uh, pepper farm and fishing post, you know, for the Benins. And that's why there's this strong linkage between Lagos and uh, Benin. And it was uh, Prince Ado who married uh, Erelukuti, an Awori woman, who gave birth to Prince Ologuntere, who also later became uh, king of Lagos. So, in terms of culture and history, there's that very strong uh, connection uh, between the royal family of Benin and the royal family of Lagos. Uh, so it was on, not until 1861 when Lagos was annexed uh, by the British, following developments, historical developments from 1851 to 1861. So it, Lagos holds special meaning, uh, both for the Lagos people of Lagos and also the people of Benin. It was Seguira, the Portuguese uh, explorer, uh, who changed the name of the city from Eko to Lagos. So there's that background there in terms of culture. And it is important that the uh, uh, of Benin was taken to the J.K. Randall Center for History, Yoruba History and Culture. It's something that he can relate with. He having been in the forefront of fighting for the restoration of cultural artifacts, the return of stolen artifacts, and also in Benin, he's been working a lot with regard to Benin history, writing the proper history and setting up a cultural center that effectively, you know, uh, documents history and establishes, you know, the legacy of the uh, people of uh, Benin Kingdom. And then, of course, third, 
during the visit at the Lagos house, Marina House, he made a point about President Tinubu having been chosen by God to be president at this time, despite all the struggles in court. And he called, he used the opportunity to also call for unity. He made a point that diversity is important. But for Nigeria to move forward, for development to be realized, either in the economy or other aspects of our lives, Nigerians must unite, live together peacefully, and work together as one people under God in one country. And then, of course, he commended uh, uh, Governor uh, Babajide Sonwulu for his giant strides. And, uh, well, the only part that, uh, you know, was showcased to the uh, Oba Benin is the cultural side, the J.K. Randu Museum. But I'm sure uh, the Oba himself is an enlightened man, <laughs> having been uh, a former ambassador. So he's an international man. He knows what is going on. And on the basis of that, he commended Governor Sowolu uh, for his uh, giant uh, strides. And I'm sure that the, all the people of the Benin Kingdom, home and abroad, will be very glad to see uh, the Oba of Benin, uh, you know, engaging in what you could call, you know, cultural diplomacy. It's not politics. It's about identifying with other communities uh, in Nigeria. And Lagos, of course, as I said, uh, has special significance. Uh, for the Oba of Benin. Oba Atope. So I, I think one thing has to be said, you know, the cultural significance, and I'm happy, about you've charted the historical antecedents, and it even goes deeper than that, you know, uh, the role Benin plays <clears throat> in the emergence, you know, of Lagos, and the sustained role, you know, in the history of Lagos that the Benin people have constantly played. A little one that, that the Oba of Lagos did give a lot of tribute, you know, a couple of uh, years ago, in a statement to the rich history and the rich historical antecedents, you know, of the Bini people. We all know the evolution of the Bini kingdom itself. We know the symbiotic relationship and how that spread into other kingdoms. And it was very historic that, you know, we had the Oba visit a very symbolic place, the Yoruba History Museum, you know, the J.K. Randall Yoruba History Museum. It has a lot of works that talked about the origin, or how the Yoruba people, you know, originated. Uh, the symbolism of what we called Ori in Yoruba, Ori Nu and Ori Ita, you know, what that means, internal head, you know, and, uh, you know, the, that of the external, which, you know, harnesses what becomes the lot of somebody, what becomes the fate, what becomes, you know, uh, the journey in someone's life. Also, that museum talks a lot about, you know, the antecedents of our culture, you know, the symbolism of trees, Abegi, where we tell stories and things like that. And it also has a digital interface and it celebrates the works of Yoruba, you know, artists like the likes of uh, Muraino or Yelami, and, you know, it, it, it goes on and on like that. So him seeing that, him seeing the rich history Lagos has got to offer and the role a lot of Benin people has also played in Lagos, it just pretty much cements that intermarriage, you know, between the great Benin kingdom and Lagos here, you know, which means a lot and uh, which has evolved over the years and which also still keeps its own colonial relics, but it has also evolved and becoming the Lagos we want today. I mean, he said other things. He called for peace, he called for unity in the country. Yes, because the country is quite divided at a time like this and all of that. So I think that pretty much wraps up the symbolism of the visit. All plans by the Edo State uh, Deputy all plans by Edo State Deputy Governor Philip Shoaibo to formally declare his intention appears set as he throws his heart in the ring against all odds. However, Shoaibo's ambition has, been, has put him as loggerheads with his principal, Governor Gordon Abaseki, who is believed not to be deposed to the deputy taking over for him. As he declares his run for governorship in elections today in Edo State under the platform of People's Democratic Party, he increases the number of politicians waiting to take over from Godwin Obaseki in Edo in 2024. My dear citizens of Edo State, we come from a lineage of greatness. Our ancestors built the old Benin Empire on bold ideas, breathtaking innovations, and matchless diligence. From the great moats of Benin to the world famous Benin Bronze Works, our ancestors dominated their time, led the Nigerian dream from the front, and created a noble frontier for our future. 
when Edo was created in 1991, our brilliant leaders, fully aware of our ancestral destiny, name us the heartbeat of the nation. That was not an ordinary slogan. It was a call to destiny, mandate that we must collectively achieve. As your deputy governor in the last seven years, I have had the privilege of working closely with our amiable governor, His Excellency Governor Godwin Obaseke, to lay a solid foundation for the progress in Edo State. Under our administration, we have seen remarkable achievements and milestones, but there is still much work to be done. Since my foray into politics three decades ago, I have lived among you. You have loved me as your own son. I felt your pain at close quarters, sat with the elders to benefit from their words of wisdom. Let the youth in many struggles for their rights, visibility, and freedom learn the intricacies of modern governance and build adequate service capacity. You all are witnesses to my antecedent in government. When the waters of Ladog Dam flooded our land and threatened our means of livelihood, I led an emergency response team that managed the impact and kept in check and continued to be involved in most humanitarian issues within the state. Our sporting treasure, Bender Insurance, became my responsibility at some point within this administration. Through strategic management and relentless commitment, we have returned Bender Insurance to the height of glory it belongs. When kidnappers took some of our citizens from Ubiaja and Igwebe train station, I worked with the rescue team, led the rescue mission from the front and brought back kidnap citizens safe and sound. Under my supervision as Deputy Governor, our internally generated revenue has grown impressively thanks to the introduction of digital and cutting-edge ideas. Back in the days, you didn't just call me Mr. Constituency Project for nothing. In my time as a legislator, I delivered 49 constituency projects at the state level and 13 solid constituency project within my short sting at the federal level. I fought the good fight for you, my people. Along the way, suffer humiliation and enjoy many moments of victory. But I am thankful in all things. I have been pressed, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Badly hurt, but not destroyed. I resonate with the tireless and irrepressible spirit of Edo people. By the grace of God, nothing and no one can stop us. After all, I be original Edo son, 100% own boy. This is why today I stand before you with great conviction, resolved, as I declare my intention to run for the office of the governor of Edo State under the platform of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in the upcoming 2024 election. A lot to talk about. His throne is out in the race. The die is cast. Dr. Bati. Well, Philip Shaibo had said he's going to declare formally today, but that statement already showed, made it clear uh, that he has already thrown his heart into the ring. Uh, but I don't know what's going to happen here. I think he has a right to seek, you know, political office, to seek to the governor of a do state, but this had uh, set him up against his boss, Godwin Obaseki. Godwin Obaseki seems to have another idea as to who should succeed him. And Philip Shaibu says there shouldn't be godfather politics in a do state and that Obaseki should not play the godfather. Now, he even had to go to court, you know, to challenge the governor. But then again, he withdrew the case in court. He apologized to the governor. He pledges loyalty, but uh, it doesn't look like the governor is convinced. He seems to see Philip Shaibu uh, as a traitor, as someone who betrayed him. But Philip Shaibu says he's from a donor, Isako constituency. After all, he represented his Isako federal, Isako constituency in the House of Assembly and also at the House of Representatives. And that a donor has only produced one governor 
for Edo State. And so for purposes of equity, it is perfectly within his rights to seek uh, that office. Well, the governor says he has accepted the apology, but I think there's still tension between them. Now, there's a story making the rounds now that he's supposed to use Etano uh, Hotel, Itano Hotel, at the government reservation area, GRE, in Benin, this morning, for the declaration. But the owner of the hotel, the hotel uh, managers, they've just informed him that, uh, that uh, the, the booking has been cancelled. And what is the explanation? That another group called uh, Obaseki Finishing Well has also booked the place, and they, they were, the hotel is prepared to return his money to him. So where will you hold the formal declaration today. Maybe we have to look for another venue. Or perhaps he will go to his office in the GRE or Sadebe Avenue, to which he has been banished uh, by the governor to do the declaration. Well, in any case, what we can plead for is peace in Edo State. And for the governor to realize that, look, no man should play God over another man's uh, future ambition. Yes, Shaibu says he's declaring, he has declared, but the party will still have to do, hold its primaries. So when the party holds its primaries, we'll see what will happen. But I'm sure for Philip Shaibo himself, he, he, doesn't, he, he shouldn't see this also as a do or die affair. But governors, you know, overbearing, trying to anoint their successors, uh, trying to determine the fate of the people. It is the people of Edo State that should be given the opportunity to choose. Mm. And what the governor should do is to help prepare provide a level playing field for all contestants and let the people choose and let the people decide. Mm. I think it's a bit uh, presumptuous for anybody to assume that they can choose who will be next governor. And that shouldn't be part of uh, 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 the democratic narrative. But that is part of the problem we have with democracy in Nigeria. One thing has to be said. The governor, or the I mean the deputy governor, has a right to his ambition. And truth has to be said, if he deems it fit to run under the PDP, he should. Because you see, I remember the case of Adam Soshomole and Governor Baseki. When Adam Soshomole felt that Governor Baseki betrayed him, Governor Baseki took his own destiny in his own hands and he went to the PDP and he got the ticket and he ran and he emerged. So, despite the fact that Governor Baseki might not be in support of this, Mr. Shoaibo has also copied what his political father, Governor Baseki, did by taking his destiny in his own hands. And he has a right to do that. Win or lose, it is the people that will determine it. I don't know when Nigerians learn this mindset of you want to be a political godfather to somebody just like what is happening in River State. Definitely, Governor, uh, what's it called? Deputy Governor Shoaibu should remember, that's not going to be an easy road. He's going to face more challenges as this has started. But if he truly believes in his conviction, he should stand for himself. And we are increasingly seeing this pattern across the country. You see Mr. Fubara and Mr. Wiki. Now, as we speak, Mr. Wiki had an interview on Monday. Mr. Fubara's people are already reacting to it and trying to set the record straight. So the so-called peace that President Tinubu brought amongst them obviously has not worked. Just like the case of Ondo that we're still going to be talking about later today, Akere Julu and Ayedatewa. One thing has to be said. Every man has a right of ambition. Also, he should be able to face the heat that will come from him. But in the end, what is in need for the people? because it's just about their political gains, not the will of the people. And except the people start being selfish about their own demands, you will never get anything out of this our political class. Let the games begin. It's going to be an interesting race. More revelations will come. More backstabbing, more betrayal, more fights will come. More people will throw their hearts in the ring. As time goes on, we'll truly see who the governor wants to come into the ring. Let the games begin. But let Edo win.